Uh, let's quickly jump to First Thessalonians chapter two. Uh, we did First Thessalonians chapter one on uh, uh, Monday, and we finished First Thessalonians chapter one on Monday. We introduced First Thessalonians on the first day, uh, which is Sunday, Saturday and Sunday. Monday we spoke about First Thessalonians. Uh, don't worry, Jesse will do that. Jesse, will, okay. We did First Thessalonians chapter one. It was quite a short chapter. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, you see two things. Because uh, as I thought about it again, basically two things, not three things, uh, that Paul talks about. Paul talks about, Paul makes a commendation. Are we together, girls? Moyo, focus here. All right? Uh, you don't know what 1 Thessalonians is, Antonia? You do? So open to 1 Thessalonians, everybody. Alia, you don't know what 1 Thessalonians is? You are looking for it? All right. Uh, we see at least two things. Number one, of course, we know that First Thessalonians, Paul is making a commendation, right? Uh, in First Thessalonians chapter one, Paul makes a commendation. First Thessalonians chapter two, into chapter three, Paul uh, shows a concern. All right, uh, yeah. So Paul makes a commendation. First things first, and then secondly, uh, Paul shows a concern, and then after that, Paul gives. Sorry, Paul talks about his conduct, rather. And then Paul talks about uh, his concern, and then Paul gives a series of commands. So you see four things in First Thessalonians. Number one, Paul gives a commendation. A commendation means to uh, sort of encourage and clap and say, oh, you guys are doing well. Uh, in chapter 2, Paul talks about his conduct. Now, please remember, in First Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul gives a commendation for two things. One, a commendation about their conviction. Paul was impressed with their conviction. In chapter 1, the second part of it, Paul gives a commendation about their conduct or their character. Are we together? Two things. Number one, he gives a commendation about what? Their what? Conviction. Not here. They gave their heart to something. Kayla, are you with me? Paul gave a commendation. Paul, Paul was clapping for them, for their conviction. It's like, wow, you guys are holding on to the right thing. But more than clapping for their, commendation, for, for their conviction, Paul also claps for their conduct. He said, oh, you guys are behaving like Christians should behave. So let's, let's quick, do a quick one through First Thessalonians chapter 1 again. Yaro, show me that uh, on the screen. Let's read it together. Just breeze through it and enter 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. All right? 1 Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1, and then I will see if we can jump into chapter 2. So if you are doing an outline, you have commendation. Uh, chapter 1 from verse 1 to 5. Of course, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 is more like an introduction or a greeting. But let's just put it together with verse 5. So number, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. Commendation of their conviction. And then chapter 1, verses 6 to 10, commendation of their conduct or character. Is that fine? So let's, let's quickly look at it as we just flow through chapter 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. Alicia, are we together? Right. We always thank God all, for all of you, mentioning you in what? Our prayers. And this is how he, this is, listen to me. Paul tells us how he thanks God for, the, for, excuse me, for them. One of the ways he thanks God for them is by praying for them. Not just by gossiping, not just by talking about them. All right? Paul shows a way of thanksgiving. He says, the way I thank God for you is that I pray for you. So every time he hits his knees, he says, oh, Lord, thank you for this church in Thessalonica. Thank you because they are a great church. Thank you, God. For the church at the light center. Thank you God for the church, the Baptist church, Bishara Baptist church. Thank you God for Living Faith Church, Sabo. Thank you God for Christ Embassy and Gomboro. Thank you God for the Catholic uh, brothers in the Catholic church in New Busa. Thank you God. And he's calling the names of these people and he's talking about them. And then look at what impresses Paul, right? Look at verse 3. He says, we continually remember before our God and Father... Your work produced by what? Faith. 
They don't just have a faith, Amarachi. Their faith is not just in their mouth. All right? It's a faith that is backed up with works. You know, James says that faith without works is what? It's dead. Paul backs up his faith. Uh, that says they back up their faith with work and says your labor prompted by what? David. Their labor is prompted by what? By love. Their labor is prompted by love. The reason they do anything they do is not because they want people to clap for them. It's not because they want people to say, oh, nice guys. It's not because they want people to say, oh, hardworking guys. Their labor was not a labor of eye service. All right? When somebody's looking at them, they are doing something. Once nobody's looking at them, they lock up. No, their labor was a labor of love. They labor because they love the people. Favor, are we together? Number one, their faith, their work, their work was a work of faith. Their labor was a labor of love. And then he says, their endurance was inspired by what? Hope. What that means is that whatever happened to them, their endurance was inspired by hope. When their classmates were laughing at them, when they went to school, and their classmates were laughing at them, I say, oh, everybody is doing this. You are the only person that is not doing this. They didn't feel discouraged. They didn't feel under pressure like, oh, wow, okay, so I have to do it too, so that I will feel along. No. They endured in hope. And what is the hope? That, look, my life is better than here and now. There's something waiting for me ahead. We said, look, everybody's trying to make money. Everybody's looking for a sharp way, smart way. Come and join us, let's make money. Come and join us, let's smoke a bit. Come and join us, let's go to party. Come and join us, let's flex a bit. They say, oh, no, 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 no. Our life is better than this. Are we together? Eliana. Our life is better than this. And their hope was because Jesus was coming for them again. Praise God. So you see their conviction right they were persuaded Konya, jesus is coming for them again and because jesus is coming for them they were not fretting they were not afraid of what people were saying they had a hope an endurance rooted in hope they were working laboring folk, anchored in love they were working anchored in faith is that fine let's move on verse 4 he says for we know brothers loved by god that he has chosen you and then he tells us how he knows that God has chosen them. He says, because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction, you know how we lived among you for your sake. Now watch that. Because our gospel came to you, give me verse 5 again, because our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. What is he saying, Salma? He's saying, if truly you are born again, if truly God has chosen you, you will see that reflected in your life by the things that drive you, by your passions. You are deeply convicted. Or somebody asks you, is cheating a sin or not? Is that, oh, well, I don't know. It depends. The conviction is shown. The conviction is heard. This is wrong because I'm born again. Not because my mother will catch me and beat me. Are you with me? I often say to the guys in the center, when you go for evaluation, when you go for break, and your friend says, oh boy, how far now? I see that you're not smoking pot anymore. Don't say, I don't do break me. No, don't tell them you went for break. Tell them, now I am born again. I'm no longer in the darkness. The things I used to do, I don't do anymore. Don't say, I'm not in the mood. The proof that you are chosen by God is shown in your conviction that the Holy Spirit convicts you with power. Look, it could be rich men. It could be powerful people. It could be people that will ask you, can you just you know, bend, compromise a little bit. It's not going to, just do this for me, my guy. Just do this for me, my guy. For all time's sake. You should be able to say, great, are we together? You should be able to say, no, now that I am born again, I no longer live this way. So Paul says, this guy in Thessalonica had a very solid conviction. And he was clapping for them for that. Then he goes from conviction and talks about, begins to commend their conduct. Look at verse 6 now. It says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcome the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. I mean, people were beating them. People were attacking them. It meant nothing to them. The fact that they were going to have Christ was better. You know, I told you about, was it... Um, Richard Wombrandt, it was the boys that watched Richard Wombrandt, yeah? 
Okay, the boys watched Richard Wombrandt. I don't know whether you guys watched the part of Richard Wombrandt's story where, where they gave a testimony about how when, when the, the guys in the Soviet Union, when they used to arrest them and they put them in jail, right? They told them to stop preaching Jesus. I wrote together, David, Tisan. They told them to stop preaching Jesus. Every time they preach about Jesus, they were going to beat them. Judith, every time they preach about Jesus, they beat them. Where's Rachel? Right, Rachel. Anytime they, they preach about Jesus, they are going to beat them. So guess what these Christians are doing? Remember they were in prison. No? So what they will do, they will stand up, they will go and preach Jesus to all the other people. Now, they were in prison. Okay? They will go and preach to the other guys in prison. They will declare the name of Jesus. Then when they come back, they will now come and meet the prison wardens. Right? Then they will now lie down. Let the prison wardens beat them. Then when the prison ward is finished beating them, they will now stand up again and go and preach. So what they so this is what they said. They said at the end of the day, beating us made them happy. Preaching made us happy. At the end of the day, all of us were happy. What a mentality, man. What a mentality. Them, every time they were beating us, they were happy. Us, every time we were preaching, we were happy. So we will go and preach. We are happy. We will come back. They will beat us. They will be happy. At the end of the day, everybody was happy. My goodness. What a testimony, right? They were not crying in jail. Oh, Lord, deliver me. Deliver me, oh, Lord. Deliver me, oh, Lord. They are not saying, uh, Holy Ghost fire consumed the people that are beating us. They are not saying, die by fire. No. They were so glad and so excited to be beaten for the sake of Christ. So he says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering, you welcome the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. It's only the Holy Spirit that can give you a joy in the midst of chaos. Everybody is complaining. The economy is hard. Times are hard. Yet your heart is always at peace. You are so excited. You are willing to help people. You are willing to give to people. People are wondering, are we not in the same economy with you guys? No. It is a conviction that the Holy Spirit gives. A joy that the Holy Spirit gives. Are we together? Move on. He says, verse 7, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Now look at this. These guys were being harassed, but because of how they were behaving, they became a model. Rahama, are we together? They became a model to other believers. Other believers began to envy them. You guys don't have the kind of money that we have. You guys don't have the kind of cars that we have. You guys are not living in the kind of houses that we live. Yet you guys are so happy. You guys are so excited. It was the joy that the Holy Spirit gives. One of the things I want you to remember, my girls, listen to me. Uh, Amaris. Who's Amaris? You? Right. Listen. One of the things I want you to remember, where's favor? Favor. Okay, that's favor. One of the things I want you to remember that the happiness, your joy in life must be given by the Holy Spirit, not by things. Is that okay? Michelle, is that okay? That your joy must be given by who? The Holy Spirit. Not by things. Aliyah, your joy must be given by who? By the Holy Spirit. Say the Holy Spirit. Right. Now, it says, so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, move on. And then he says, the lost message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. Your faith speaks for itself. You know, the people, people often say, a picture is worth about a thousand words, right? I mean, their testimony was worth a thousand, I mean, their life was, was worth a thousand testimonies. People could beat their chest and say, Kai, one may be one may be And I've often asked you, can people look at your life and beat themselves and say, Kai, one may be Look, don't always hide under the canopy of God sees the heart. You know, you don't judge by the body, don't judge by the looks. No, 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 no. God sees the heart. Coramdio, Coramundo. People must be able to see your life. The Bible says, Let your light so shine before what? Before men. Not before God. Your light so shine before men. 
that they might what? See your good works, Tehila, and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light so shine. Look, don't be a Christian here. And then when you go to the street, you are a street boy. Are you with me? And then when you go to other people, you are, you are, you are, you are what they are. No, don't do that. Right? Look, I've seen people who are Christians, like who are Christians, and, and they are ashamed, they are afraid of their salvation. Now, possibly some of them are Muslims, right? They were Muslims and then they became Christians. So when, when, they, when they went back to their Muslim community and they met their Muslim brothers, they do everything the Muslim brothers do. They do salati. Right? When they want to greet people, they greet people the same way Muslims greet them. They are, they are ashamed of the fact that they are Christ. You see somebody who was once upon a time in a cycle of people. He used to be a clubber. He used to go to club or something. Now he's born again. And then when he meets his people, maybe he was in a cult before. How they used to greet in their cult. When he meets his cult guys, right? They go and they greet. No! When they do, they say, no. This is not me. Now I am born again. Your life must be worth a thousand testimonies. He says, therefore we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. The other Christians, Antonia, are you with me? The other people in other communities were the ones testifying. Say, wow. Do you know Antonia? Antonia is a very great Christian. People in other schools, people in other classes. Are you with me? What class are you? Five. Five what? A or B? You just only one primary five? Great. People in primary four. People in primary six. People in just one. People in primary three. All of them are saying, if you're looking for a true Christian girl, you go to primary five. You're going to find Antonia there. Can people say, when you sit amongst your friends, can people say, when you go for old boys association, can people say, oh, let us ask Jesse to pray for us because he's the pastor amongst us. Jesse doesn't have any call out, but he says, Kai, she's a man of God. Can the other people, listen to me, can the other people be ashamed of their lifestyles when you are there? Or do the other guys feel so comfortable? I, listen, it's not you going to tell them, you know I'm a man of God. You know I'm a man of God. You know I'm a pastor. No! Does your life contradict others? Look at what they did. G. It says, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from what? To do what? My goodness. Esteem Mama. You see that? He said they turned from they turned to God from what? From idols to serve the living and true God. They didn't leave idols for nothing. Say, oh, but why are you didn't? I said, Omo, oh, I just did. I just did. They were proud to say, Omo, oh, I know this street again. Me and a church boy. It's not like saying, oh, you know, say, oh, but I found out. I say, no, I know this street again. Where are you doing? Omo, oh, I just did. I just did do one or two. Just to keep body and soul together. That's not clear. That's not clear. So, but where are you doing? I'm church boy. If you want to find me, find me for church. Right? Look, I tell people, you want to find me? This is where you are going to find me. Where you want to find me before? It's okay. Okay, we know they see. If you know they see me, see where you will see me. It's, it's where I want to go, Jess. Where I want to go. Do you get what I'm saying? Listen, don't tell them. I know they do one or two anymore. No, this is where I belong. Tell me, Jesus boy. I'm not, listen, not Jesus boy on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. No. Jesus boy, real life. Jesus body. Jesus doesn't have a body. Tama, does Jesus have body? Tara, does Jesus have body? Does Jesus have body, my girls? Does, is there anything like Jesus body? There's nothing like Jesus body. You hear about They tell us, they tell how you turn to serve God from idols to serve the living and true God. Verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who does what? Rescues us from the wrath 
to come. That was a summary of the entirety of chapter 1. Paul commends their conviction. Paul commends their conduct. And so we jump into chapter 2. Chapter 2, the big idea of chapter 2 is Paul's conduct in the church of Christ. Remember, chapter 1 is Paul's commendation of the church of Christ. Chapter 2 is Paul's conduct in the church of Christ. So Paul talks about their conduct and then he turns to talk about his conduct. He gives us a beautiful flow. First of all, he talks about their conduct. How their conduct was impeccable. He commends their conduct. Then he suddenly turns to talk about his own conduct. Kayla, are you reading with us? Is your mind here? Right. Look at verse 1. We're going to read verse 1 to 13. So give us that on the screen. Verse 1 to 13. And then I'm going to ask you, what do you see about, about Paul's conduct? All right? So let's read together. 3, 2, 1, go. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dare to tell you this gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. Look at verse 6. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you. But we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because we had become so dear to us. Verse 9, Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believe. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. 13. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. Fantastic reading. Look at verse 11. There's a bomb blast of a verse in that verse. Look at verse 11, right? Oh, sorry, verse 10. This is mind-blowing. Paul says, you are witnesses of our conduct. He says, and so is God. Look, Paul didn't say, you guys are witnesses alone. He said, look, God is our witness. Do you know what it means to call God as a witness? What, what manner of life that Paul is able to say, I call God as a witness to this case. Wow. He says, you are witnesses. And so is God. Listen, he says, God is our witness that we are holy, that we are righteous, and we are blameless. Kai. Omo men, the men mount. That is this is the real men mount. Not the useless one that people wear, but that was a man. No, no. This is the real man mount. Ah! Please, you need to say, yeah. Man, they. As in, men gallant everywhere. 
They are men. They choke. Jay-Z. You didn't see men. He's not the one that somebody will hold 5K. He's not the man. Get out. Come on. Do this. If I slap you, will you get out? <laughs> eh? No, no, come on. Carry 500K. Do you fully apply? Apply. Man, man, man. Why? Because the person just bought two crates of Merinda. Will you get out? Right? You better come and declare uh, Awara for the whole street. You say you, people like Joyce will be healing him because Joyce likes Awara very well. <laughs> no! Paul says, you, you, not just you people, God is our witness. Look at the manner of men that we were. We were holy, we were righteous, we were blameless. When we were among you who believed. Kai. Anyway, so now that we've read it, let's break down. Uh, for my own outline, I have three points or points from 1 to 13. So let me hear, what, what do we see there about Paul's conduct? Jagavan, what do you see about Paul's conduct? Read very well. Amir, Jabal, sorry. Read. Everybody. Open the Bible and share with him now. Why didn't you carry another Bible in the room? Why didn't you carry another Bible inside? Alright, it's fine. You share that one. Share that one. What do you see about Paul's conduct that is striking? Moya, you want to share something? Yeah, thank you, my girl. Go on. Gentle. What verse is that? I, I, your name is no Moyo. It's Moyo that answered. Verse 7. He was gentle. Right. Who else? Let's look at, let's look at verse 7. I wrote give us verse 7. But we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her child. Thank you, Moyo. What else do we see? He was courageous. What verse is that? Read it for us. Very courageous. Look at his conduct. Yeah. Tisan, you wanted to say something? What? His conduct was committed to the gospel. What verse is that? Okay. Al uh, Alia? Yeah. Huh? Truth. What verse is that? Righteous and blameless. Great. Righteous and blameless. Yeah, my darling. His own conduct. Uh, do you see anything about his conduct that, that interest that is interesting? Yeah, Esther. He was entrusted with the gospel, and he preached the gospel. Yeah. He spoke about the witness of man and God. Right, that his conduct was holy, righteous, and blameless. Raham, I wanted to say something. Is it the same thing? Right, Tisan. Uncovetous, without covetousness. That's a very good one. Yeah. Prince. Preach the gospel. Right. Always giving thanks to God. Entrusted with the gospel. Followers of God. Give me a high five. Ouch. They didn't use flattery words. Now listen. Paul talks about this conduct. At least you see three things. Stay with me, please. At least you see three things. The first thing you see is look at verse 1 to 5. Give us that on the screen. Let's take it in bits and pieces. Look at verses 1 to 5. What do you see about Paul's conduct? Just capture it for me in one word. So let, let me help you outline, all right? Paul's conduct, right? The three, the three outlines are free from this, free from this, free from this. 
That's how I did my outline. So, from verse 1 to 5, Paul is free from what? His conduct was free from what? Verses 6 to 8, he's free from something else. Verses 9 to 13, he's free from something else. Take out, take, pause and read, about, read it. You want to try? Go on. Come and give me a hug. Right, what's your name? You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. Move on. It says, we had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi. As you know, but with the help of our God, we dare to tell you this gospel in spite of strong opposition. Move on. It says, for the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives. What we are saying to you, there is no hidden agenda. Are you with me? It's not, there are no impure motives. We are not trying to trick you. We're not playing games with you. Listen to me, please. This is some more, there's so much you can learn from here. Look at verse 4. It says, On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. We're not deceiving you. We're not hypocrites. Look at verse 5. He says, you know we never use flattery. That word again. Hypocrisy or deceit. Nor did we put on a max to cover up greed. God is our witness. Oh my goodness. If you know anything about ministry, you will know that this is a big deal. There are a, there are a lot of people that minister under hypocrisy. I'm, you know, I'm not just talking about hypocrisy that the person uh, is, is living in a, in a private scene. No, that's what I'm talking about. Are you with me? There are people that want to be invited to particular churches or particular programs because they know that when they go there, the honorarium is heavy. Are you together? If they invite them to uh, one Baptist church or one Equa church in Malagum 2, you don't have a place to call Malagum. You hear the name of the place, man? <laughs> Malagum. <laughs> eh? If they went to Malagum 2, 2 or not Malagum 1. <laughs> Aya. <laughs> or they invite you to Kukum Daji. You hear the name of the place? Daji. Kukum Daji. Oh God. They don't want to go there. Konya, they don't want to go to preach there. But you invite them to, you know, Springs of Anointing International Church. Ah, yeah. Or if you invite them to the chapel at Life Center, they know that Auntie Debbie will prepare hamper for them. And Auntie Jane. And that the Jabba will give them envelope. With light work logo and hamper with light work t shirt. <laughs> and today, you people with intercontinental ministry. <laughs> One time we had the program here. Was it? Was it? Illuminate, I think. So, one of our guest speakers, you know, that year, I mean, we went and prepared a special car to go and pick him. You know, one of the cars in the house, we put a, a CG tinted. So we went to the Uncle Musa went to the man's house. Went and wait and waited for the man. Left AC running, car cool. By the time the man came in, Jesse, that time this chapel did they hadn't built this chapel. He drove the man in, ushered the man in, he sat down. Ah! VIP treatment when he finished, before he would come out of the uh, small chapel. Tama, Etara. 
engine was running chill everywhere cool like deep freezer by the time we opened the door of the car now now deep freezer cold of the come out no school by the time the man enter anita we gave him hamper the hamper doing the inside different kind of doings do his choke where where no when the man went back home he had to cry he said he has been in this ministry for nearly 30 years he said he has not been treated like this you know some people like those kind of but where you go and they'll tell you in fact in jim Bear's village the usher will just carry one zobo inside leather and two puff puff he said, <laughs> 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 he said you play drum for like wow you lead song play drum worship go you pray ah. <laughs> say the lord be with you when you go to batun koji that's not your village you see batun koji or one boy by think that place jesus <laughs> that place is remaining small for you if you reach one place but you come down you carry your car <laughs> do you people have bridge where that water has swept <laughs> zara your mother's village water has swept the bridge oh. no road I'm telling you, you are driving with big big gallop. <laughs> hey, that, those kind of places. If you go for ministry, hey, God, <laughs> you can be preaching the message of the gospel. Right? People like the back Jews say, Pastor, why me? Can I was me? Any? But you know, listen to me. Paul said, when we came to you, we were not hiding anything. We didn't have ulterior motive. We didn't, we didn't reserve our best for bigger places. We gave the best of the best to you. Are we together? Look. You know, have you seen people that when they invite a big, in quote, big minister, the way they treat him is different from when they invite somebody from around? Have you seen that before? That's hypocrisy. That's what Paul is talking about. The way, the way you treat whoever is the way you must step it down. Paul says there was nothing hidden about our ministry. We were not hypocrites. We are not deceptive. Let me ask you something. Now, listen, listen. I've, I've also seen people, I've also seen people that if you invite them to pray for, if you invite them to pray for Daddy Jabal now, they will pray with all their sweat and muscle. Because, you know, maybe he will dash them messages. You know that Jabal, he has money. You look, just look at him, say this one, Kai, don't go Jilani. Maybe after praying for him, you remove $1,000. You give him. Right? At least I will call the person to pray for me. He will not pray for me. Well, he say when I had an answer, my father for us, my you know. They listen. There are people that choose like that. They pray for some people with their whole power. They will even go and fast. But if somebody comes, you say it's well with you, my brother. It's well. The Lord will do it for you. Because that one, uh, the end of the day, I say, thank you, sir. The Lord has done it. That's all you will tell them. But because they know that the Jabal, you give the envelope. White, white notes, white, white ones. You give them, not the red or green. White. They will pray well. Paul said when, when we came to you, you know that we never use flattery. We did not use put a mask to cover up our greed. It says God is our what? Look at Paul's conduct. 
free from greed free from deceit free from hypocrisy like you said now what's the second thing we see look at verse 6 to 8 what's another thing that we see there What else do we see? Yeah. Oh, let's start with Moyo. Free from what? Oh, it's clear, caring. All right, that's right. Free from what, Tisan? Okay. Let somebody should capture it for me. Both of you are, yeah. Rahama. Try it for me. Six to eight. G. Somebody says something. Self. Self. Free from self. Free from self. That's what you are trying to say. I get that. From the body. From the flesh. And look. It's free from. A captured word is self. Look at verse six. Right to eight. It says. We were not looking for praise from men. Not from you or from anyone as apostles of Christ we could have been a burden to you we have a right to move on but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children look at what he's saying in verse 6 we, look if we made a demand of you we deserve it we deserve it if we made a demand of you right he says move on but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for her little children look at the next verse we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of god but what our lives we were willing to give you ourselves it's not look it's not just the gospel we gave you ourselves it's not busy i don't preach for you i don't come on my hand if you want to die die go ahead like your business is it Allah Allah is an actually hacking now? No. He didn't say, Me now I preach to you. If you want to go to hell, go to hell. My hands are free from your blood. No. Paul said, We did not only share the gospel with you, but we shared our what? We gave you our lives. Because we took you like family. You've become so dear to us. Mark 10. Are we together? He said, listen, my conduct towards you was filled with love, filled with gentleness, filled with compassion, filled with care. It was selfless. I didn't think about myself. We were not thinking about ourselves. We were thinking about you. You see Paul replicate this in the church at Philippi. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He said, look, which is better for me to go home and be with the Lord. But you know what? For your sakes, I'd rather remain. You see that again in Romans chapter 1. Paul says, I desire so much to be with you so that I will impart unto you at least some spiritual benefit. Listen to me, man. Listen to me. Paul was always eager, elder, to go to places because he wanted them to know about Christ and to share his life. It wasn't about how he was going to be treated. Are you with me? He said, "Watch I'm going to find that Jay, but that's who, but that's who, but that's who Kulade Niwa. How can that be your problem? What is more important to you, the fact that they gave you an honorarium, the fact that they put you in a hotel, or the fact that you are sharing the gospel and people are saved? What is more important to you? Come on." If you can afford it, go to places. Preach Christ. Preach Christ. Let people know about God. You know what we learned in Philippians? Look, even if people are going to disrespect you, preach Christ to them. It's one of our ambassadors. 
What kind of nonsense? Oh my goodness. The moment you see it, say that, that is carnality. Paul says, look, I'm willing to be called a fool if it's because of the preaching of this gospel. As long as it gets across to you. He said, ah, uh, Ogamusa, a whole director, that has a matter of security man I get. He said, oh God, you're not supposed to sit down with people like us. What do you mean I'm not supposed to know people like you? This is why I'm here. To preach the gospel. Give them lift. Listen to me. If you have a car, give them lift. Auntie Debbie, give them lift. Give the cleaners a lift. Drive them all the way to the front of their houses. Know where they live for the sake of sharing the gospel. Anita Obanyiro, help them out. The woman selling kosh and dosh. You can share the go Let's, Mama, can I help you? It's not reducing your stees anything. Forget that nonsense. Don't say star girl. Rapping kose in newspaper. You, and then you are ashamed that your friends will snap you. Darlene, they go and say, ah, with your fine attachment. You are selling kose by the road. How is that a big deal? If that is going to give you an inroad to the woman's life. Are we together? Say with all your degree, you are sitting down with these people. Come on now, come on now. You say, I deserve something better. I mean, people say a lot of nonsense and they don't know what they are saying. He said, say, God forbid. I will. And the funny thing is that you know how to teach you. He said, God forbid. I will never teach in this life. I'm about tired of talking about Kariani. He said, me, I will never, I'd rather die. He said, if there's any job I hate in this life, it's, this, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's because they are not paying well. If they start paying teachers for 150000 every month, you will say, in fact, sir, when they gave birth to me, <laughs> the, first, the first gift they gave me, Is <laughs> yes, you don't know me. Oh. You don't know me. That T, that T, my name is teacher. He says, sir, you don't know me. Teaching. Do you know? Do you know, sir, how many for how many years I've been sleeping in the night? I will see alphabet, alphabet, time table. <laughs> Look, it's not teaching that's your problem. It's the money. Are we together? I've told you several things. People want mammon. Just start giving teachers plenty money. You will see. Application, you won't see space. Oh, God. Sometimes, God puts us in places like that. Not for the sake of the money. Sometimes for the sake of the people who will teach the word of God. Are you with me? And I can tell you that. I've been a teacher all my life. And I've had, think of the most ridiculous offers. I've had them. And I'll be speaking English for prof. I'll be speaking English for you. You know? And look. There is nothing as beautiful as having an opportunity to preach Christ. And listen to me. This is one of the reasons I love the class. And I'm not, I'm not trying to magnify the Mrs. Last Officer. That's what I'm doing. I'm telling you for a shorty, there are few jobs in this life that give you the opportunities that, that teachers have. You see teachers? You see health workers? Health workers, man? They are always meeting with people. Market people. Not online vendor. Not online vendor. <laughs> Not what you see versus what you get. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Health workers, teachers, they are always meeting. In fact, teachers are even easier. 
Because teachers have the, an opportunity to systematically disable people. Because you have the same group of people in your class for at least one year or one semester or three months. Then they will now do GA and another set will come. And you will keep making contact with them over a time. Then, another, you know, doctors, you might see somebody today, tomorrow the person will die. Game over. And nurses, many nurses, we care people. I've suffered in the hands of nurses, that's why, when I was small. Some of them, they will hold syringe. Then they will now remove the air. You are seeing the F. I didn't see the water. Oh, hey, God. Oh, no. But teachers so you see number one paul says my conduct is free from hypocrisy or deceit number two his conduct is free from self let's look at the third one before we go verse 9 to 13 surely you remember brothers our toil and hardship we worked night and day in order not to be a burden to you to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses. And so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Now this is interesting, right? Look at verse 11. Give us verse 7, Yaru. Then look at verse 11. Paul first of all says in verse 7, We were gentle among you. Like a mother caring for her children. Right? Talks about mothers. Then he goes and talks about fathers. Right? Balance equation. Take us back to 11. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Move on. Encouraging. Please listen to me. This is Paul Lochi suggests to us what fathers should do to their children. Are you with me? How about go? Your daddy is behind though. Take it easy, my boy. <laughs> right? Encouraging, comforting, urging. This is the threefold agenda of fathers. And I'm glad that this room is filled with men. And many of you are not yet married. Don't say that one abu fa ba kwe amana ba. Yo, I'm kwe amu kwa chiki sunen yesu kuti amen. You are not in the darkness. You know, Martin, you there? No, no, no. Fathers, encouraging, comforting, and what? Urging. What does it mean to urge? To push, to challenge. Challenge the person to be better. Tisan, are you hearing? David, are you hearing? All of you young boys. Sammy, are you hearing? Don't say, I still have time. Till I'm 20 something. You hear me? Start hearing now. Planning. The purpose of godly men, it says, is to encourage, comfort, and urge. Now, that urging, part of it is to teach. Is that okay? You, Kuma, sisters in the Lord, if you like, go and follow any kind of, of two for five naira outside and come and say you don't know. The day you call me to pray for you, man, when any of my latest album, The City I Light, man, don't download the inside earpiece. 
to encourage you. Are you children? Look at this old woman. Who is going to encourage you? Are you a child? Mothers, they've spoken about you in chapter verse 7 already. Oh, we're talking about children, you're saying encourage us. Who is us? My friend. Come on, my friend. You are children of God. Carry on home. Madam. Yeah, I see thing. Look, this is the point I'm making. Encourage, comforting, and urging. Please listen. If you need to write that, I put it on your wall. Gentlemen, do that. All right, and remind yourself. Am I Remind yourself who, that as I grow, when I get married, my job as a man is to what? As a father is to what? Do what? Look at it on the screen. To do what? Encourage. Do what? Comfort. And what? Urge. Give us the amplified. Can you find the amplified of that? Who has amplified? Let's read it. Anybody has a profile on his phone? Do you know how to find amplified? Right. For you know how as a father dealing with his children, we used to exhort, that is to teach, exhort each of you personally stimulating and encouraging and what? Charging you. Stimulating, in other words, ginger. Ginger them. Give them ginger. Not the one the boy will come. He say, ah, daddy, I failed my exam. You say, you see your brain? He say, when I was like you, I got 17A, 13B. You, what do you know? Nothing. It's only to watch cartoon. No. Ginger the boy. Ginger him. Are you with me? Ginger the girl. He say, he say, he say, daddy, when I went to school, one boy told me that my head is like basketball. Say, hey, hype the, listen, pump confidence, pump confidence into the boy. You know what's in that, man? One day, the down, one woman looked at him and said, look at your ugly face. He said, well, I'm not ugly. I'm a very fine boy. <laughs> He said, I'm a very fine boy. He said, who told you? He said, my mother told me. I'm a very fine boy. <laughs> you people not in that, man. Straight. You know, if, if you cannot chance him, if you talk, you talk, you tell you his mind. He said, you look at you, your ugly face. He said, I'm not ugly. He said, I'm a very fine boy. My mother used to tell me I'm a very fine boy. Listen, ginger them till they feel confident. Stimulate, encourage them. You know, this earlier this morning, I was I had an opportunity to speak on an apologetic session uh, somewhere, and so one one of the questions, you know, Zomo, you are with me, right? You know, I told you that I've been hearing the questions, right? P young people asking questions, and the questions are different. Have you noticed that we didn't ask one similar question from yesterday and today? We had, we had about, about seven, eight questions yesterday. Some people asked two questions, two, three questions. Today we had a girl that asked about five questions, four, five questions, right? We had about ten questions. So in like two sessions, I've had about less than maybe 17 questions. Same set of people. They didn't repeat any question. Some people have questions. So one of the ladies was talking about how it was a little bit off our discussion. We're talking about how she just finds it difficult to retain what she reads. You remember that question? And so, you know, I was, I was now asking about a particular thing that I mentioned yesterday. And she mentioned it. I said, you see what I'm telling you? There's nothing wrong with your memory. Your memory is sharp because you are remembering. And I, I gave her instances of things and she recalled them. I said, take for example, what is the theme of your church this year? 
she told me, I said, how come you remember it? He said, eh, maybe because I've seen it severally. I said, so that means your memory is doing fine. It just means your approach to learning might need to change. Possibly if you are reading a book like this, you are thinking of the beans you will cook. You are thinking of the place you will wash. Half of the time you will forget everything you are reading. But if you take another approach, your memory will pop. I said, so there's nothing wrong with your memory. And she said, actually, you, actually, you. And she felt lighter and encouraged. Don't say, oh, run down the person. Paul says, we exhort each of you personally, stimulating, encouraging, and charging you. Now, please, I beg you mothers and aunties and sisters, don't say this is just for the fathers. So you, if they come, you will tackle the person. Then you now go to the father, the father will stimulate. No. It is both parties. Are you with me? Are we together? Please, it is both parties. Let your speech be seasoned with what? Salt, with grace as with salt. Somebody brings his call to you. I got 54 over 100. He said, okay, oh, what happened now? He said, I don't know. He said, oh, don't worry. Next time, Kacha kacha to 97. I want you now. You see, you don't even project any form of you disappointed me, you failed. You're telling him, don't worry. Next time, be ready for them. You will show them pepper. That's how you boost confidence. Right? Gabal, is that you are feeling me today? You know, if you look at the story of the prodigal son, when the boy came back home, you know the father didn't tell him, so what did you do with that money? You know, some of you, if it's your mother, especially if she's Southern Kaduna mother, she'll tell you, Kara Kashiga Gidana, say Kaja Kadado. Or she'll say, Kakoma, Kakoma, wouldn't the Kakashi Kudina. Kara Kadawana Gidan. Am I correct? <laughs> I sure all of us have the same kind of mother. He said, In which house? Make sure if you don't go back to that place, if you don't bring back that money, just go and sleep there. No. You know what the father did? The father saw the boy from afar off. Kayla, do you know what the father did? The father ran straight to the boy, put his arms around him, and told the servant, Slaughter the what? Fatted calf. Sharp, 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 sharp. He said, Bring new buff up. They put a new ring on his finger, Salma. He said, Put a ring, put a fine dress on him, and said, my son, who was once upon a time dead, is now alive. Let's read 11, 12, and 13. 12 and 13. It says, To live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and the glorious blessedness in which true believers will enter after Christ's return. Verse 13. And we also, especially, thank God continually for this, that when you receive the message of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of mere men, but as it truly is the word of God, which is effectually at work in you, who believe, exercising its superhuman power in those who adhere to and trust it and rely on it. So give us back the KJV or NIV. So what is the last one that we see? Free from what? Tisan. Free from what? Laziness. Ah, no. No? What? Yeah. I used another word, but it borders around blame. No. A more encompassing word. English teacher. No. Kai, what do you mean now? Inequality and marginalization, that's too far. K -k break it down, break it down. Give me an easier word. Free from what? Huh? Yeah, that's, that's correct. But give me a more encompassing word. Blame is correct. Accusation is correct. Give me a more encompassing word. No. Hi! Oh! I threw that out of order. Thank you. That's a better word. Free from reproach. Reproach is more encapsulating. Now look at verse 11, right? He talks about sin. 
talks about blameless, it talks about holiness. Sorry, 10. It says, how holy, how righteous, how blameless. So it's a more encapsulating word than just blamelessness. Holy, we were without sin. There were no accusations. We were righteous. We are blameless. We are upright. We are without reproach. Nobody can point a finger at us about anything. Reproach covers every aspect of your life. Spiritual, social, physical, every aspect. So Paul talks about his conduct. He says, my conduct is free from deceit. My conduct is free from what again? Self. And thirdly, my conduct is free from what? Reproach. So we've dealt with the first two things about First Thessalonians. Paul's commendation of the church. Paul's conduct in the church. Alright, let me stop here. Anybody has any questions? Any question quickly or any additions before we... Any question? No question at all? Does everybody understand what I said? Kona Jijimokuneo. Right. So do you have the outline arrow now for chapter 1 and chapter 2, 1 to 13? You are writing it down? Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right, so God is all-knowing and God is uh, all-powerful. Is it necessary that we even mention everything that is our prayer to God? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. And let me tell you why. Because, in fact, there's a part of the Bible that says, uh, it just flashed in my face and it skipped my mind just now, right? But basically, we, in prayer, prayer is, one of the things that prayer does is to enable us to trust God's wisdom. Alright? When we pray, for example, uh, take, good, let, me, let me use a good example of, let's say, let's say maybe this and any of my boys, right? They, they, they shouldn't come and they don't have to come and beg me for food. Right? Why? Because I'm their father. And I'm a good father. I should provide food for them. Even before they ask, I should provide for them. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, my job as a good father, and God shows us that, that God makes provision for us even before we ask. Are we together? But again, now, still in a real-time real scenario. Imagine sometime, somebody wakes up at 2 a.m. and says he wants you to cook on the dam. Now, not because eating food is wrong, but that's not the time. There, maybe there has to be an anomaly. There's something wrong. Sleep till morning. We'll give you food in the morning. This is not time for you to eat. You get what I'm saying? So, there are times that people, you know, make, because they feel like, oh, God is not giving us this at this time. God is not giving us that at this And I often tell people that you cannot twist the hand of God to do what God doesn't intend to do. Let me remind you, you cannot twist the hand of God. Whatever God does is because he allows it or he permits it. If it is true that we can twist the hand of God, all the people you have been praying for today, they will have died, including the former president and the former governor. 
that shows you that God does what is right in his eyes, not in our eyes. Now, if God does something that we prayed for, it is not our prayers that made that thing work. It is because in the eyes of God, that thing is right. You follow what I'm saying? It is not your prayers that made God do it. God did it because it is right. It just happened that your prayer aligned with what God wanted to do. So now in your mind, you will assume that it is your prayer that made it happen. It's not your prayer that made it happen. Give an instance. God wants the salvation of the lost. If I go out to preach the gospel somewhere and people are saved, now I prayed for hours before I went there. It's not my prayers that made people to be saved. No, God wants people to be saved. My prayer just agreed with what God wanted to be done. You get what I'm saying? And like we said last week, while we are praying, prayer makes us sharper spiritually. Sharper in the sense that you are hearing God's voice, you are hearing God's instruction, right? You are receiving God's power to get the job done. You follow what I'm saying? So it's not, it's not that, oh, it is prayer that I made God to do the work. No. God's intent was to do that work. So when we pray for the sick, God desires to heal the sick. The sick are healed because it is God's intent. That's why if God desires that the person comes home to rest, even if you like fast for one year, the person will not be well. God will still take him back home. You get what I'm saying? Uh, even in healing ministries, I can tell you that a lot of people sometimes, you know a lot of healing ministers don't tell you the exact entire truth. A lot. I didn't say all of them. A lot. And you know, media or church media likes to project the ones that worked. They won't tell you the ones that failed or the ones that didn't happen how they wanted it. You get what I'm saying? And I don't know why churches do that. That we should be honest and transparent enough to say, when an amateur do I ask This is further affirming the sovereignty of God over issues. Take for example, there's one popular church in this country that the former House of Reps member that died recently went to the church, right? It was all over social media. Did the guy die? Of course the guy died. Did the church media carry that news? No, but if the girl that went there and got healed, they carried that news. So it looks like, oh, okay, this church, once the man of God prays for you, everybody is going to be healed. But meanwhile, in that sense, people are dying. People have been brought to that place and they died. What is wrong when you say, okay, this person, in fact, I know of certain particular churches that they don't used to announce deaths that a church member died. Ah, isn't death part of God's plan? It's ridiculous. They never announced death of church, church member. Ah! It's just amazing. So you see the lies and the, the hypocrisy in some of the settings that we're operating with. Are you with me? But this is the point that I'm making, Elder. That when we pray, our, the purpose of our prayer is to align with what God has said. And we pray in faith. And what is that faith? We pray from the word of God. The word of God helps us to align with what God's purpose is. And that way when we pray, we get answers. Are you with me? So, if for example, you are looking for admission, you trust in the wisdom of God. Right? That, Lord, my daughter or my son has finished wire can jam and all that. Right? You know, and, and I'm going to be honest with you as a person. I'm going to be honest with you as a person. I don't, I don't know about it, but personally, when I pray, I don't have prayer requests of needs. And I'm being honest with you. Right? Most of my prayers are Christian or spiritual formation. When I mean Christian or spiritual formation, most of my prayers are prayers that have to do with God conforming my will, my heart, my passions, my desires to Him. They're not prayers of God, give me, give me, I want something. So, assuming now, let's say somebody here is my child and then he finishes Wayek or Jam and he applied for Wayek or Jam, um, for, uh, Wayek, applied for admission, right? The last thing on my mind is to pray for him to get admission. Apply. 
If you get admission, fine. If you don't get admission, come and keep learning the word of God. Because at the end of the journey, we are not competing with anybody. Conform to Christ. And I've often said, I don't care what my son wants to become. As long as he is godly. That's all that matters to me. Are you with me? I'm not entitled that I want to be a carpenter, or a footballer, or a basketballer, or a... What is your business? As long as you are godly and you know the Lord, that is fine. You follow what I'm saying? So, our prayers must be rested in God's wisdom. That God is wise. God is wise enough to know that this girl should go to school now. And if this girl doesn't go to school now, God is wise enough to know why she didn't go to school. That is not the prayer point. That is not for me to go and challenge God. Because God is wise enough. Look, there is no man powerful enough to stop a move of God from happening. You get what I'm saying? No, there's no man powerful enough. There's no man powerful enough to do that. Are you with me? So, lastly, about the issues of prayer, the Bible says, delight yourselves in the Lord, and the Lord will give you the desires of your heart. When we say the desires of your heart, it's not what your heart wants. What actually God does is God makes your desires, God puts his desires in your heart. So that what you now begin to desire is what God desires. That's what that prayer means. Many of us have turned that prayer to say that, oh, God will give you the desires of your heart. That means whatever your heart wants, God will give you. That's not what it says. Actually, it says that what your heart will want is God that will put that desire inside you. That's what that prayer says. Okay? So, for us, we trust the wisdom of God. Why don't I have this now? Because it is not in... God doesn't think that I need it. Are you with me? And when you are ready for it, you will know. So, when we pray, this is what I'm saying in a nutshell. Trust the wisdom of God. Trust the love of God. Are you with me? Trust the wisdom of God. Trust the love of God. If your child is going to school, Father, thank you because you are giving this girl or this boy wisdom to make the right choices. That's, that's, what, that's what your prayer should be. When the child goes to school, you pray, say, Lord, grant this boy or this girl the courage to stand out for you and impact these people for your sake and for your kingdom. You get what I'm saying? While, while, while this boy, yes, mama. Why do people pray like that? In fact, a simple answer, Mama, is sheer ungodliness. It's ignorance. It's, Mama's question is, why do people pray for, for, their, for other people to die? Right? Let me give you an example. Uh, give me Luke chapter 9, verse 54. Right? Luke chapter 9. Alright, so let's open it in our hard copy Bibles if it's taking too long. Alright, so look at that. Give me, give me, give me the verse now, yeah. What's happening? Yeah, what's happening now? When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord. Do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Give me the KJV. Look at that, Mama. It says, when the disciples James and John saw this, and this was where Jesus went into a city, and they did not respect him. The disciples of Jesus got angry. How will our master, our OG, come into this place and they will not respect him? And so they said, when the disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? <clears throat> Even as Elias did. Look at the next verse. Verse 55. But he turned and rebuked them and said, you know, no, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. Look at the next verse. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. 
So once people start praying, people should die, fire should come. They don't know. You, you don't, it's, it's pure ignorance. And that's what the Bible says. You don't even know what manner of spirit you are of. Jesus said, the Son of Man is not to come to destroy man's life, but to save them. So the people that we are praying for to die are people that Jesus paid for with his blood. Why are we praying for them to die? Those are people we should go and preach the gospel to. Not pray for them to die. People are committing great evils. Some of them is because they are under the shackles of the enemy. What they need is to be delivered from the power of the enemy or from the power of darkness. That deliverance comes by the preaching of the gospel of Christ. You shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. But we don't want to go and preach the gospel. We want to follow the easy way out. Let them just die. So if anybody supports that, is is ignorance. Straight. It's not even something to debate. All right? Is that fine, Mama? Right. Let's rise to our feet as we pray. Our God willing, we'll continue on uh, Saturday morning. Please keep praying. Uh, our girls are here. Praise the Lord. And let's keep praying for them that it will be a transformative uh, time as we go through the camp together. And now may the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord give you his peace. May the Lord send you help from Zion. And may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. I love you. Shake somebody, hug somebody, love somebody.